Want to buy a rental with only 5% down? Or how about finance a building to 110% loan to value? No, I don't have a time machine and send you back to 2006 when you could do all these crazy loans. These are legitimate loans being written today and they're all being done on the commercial side of the business. The commercial side of the mortgage business is completely different than residential. Uh, side note, this particular episode is for my Canadian listeners. So if you're somewhere else, you may, maybe this is similar for you, but probably not. And today on the show, I have Tuan Long. Tuan is an expert in commercial finance and what an awesome dude. And he shares with me the four myths of commercial financing. And I guarantee you, unless you do this for a living, there's going to be stuff in this episode that you didn't know. And there's probably deals sitting on your desk in your database that are like, oh my gosh, there's A, I could make some money, B, help my clients. Uh, and so you're really going to want to pay attention to this episode. Uh, before I jump into that, Hey, I'm Scott Packford. This is the I Love Mortgage Brokering Podcast, and we are the number one podcast for mortgage brokers and loan officers. If you are listening to this, thank you. Do me a favor. Go ahead, smash that subscribe button up so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. And before we jump into this conversation with Tuan, I'm going to give you a, a shout out to our title sponsor, Finmo. Finmo is a Canadian mortgage application, document collection, submission platform designed specifically for Canadian borrowers. It's very easy to use. It's got cool features like smart docs. So fill the, when the client fills out the app, it knows what documents they need. It's got smart submission notes, pulls key data from the application. When they hit the submit button, it gets you a better chance of getting an approval. And it's connected to Lender Spotlight, which is the best tool for searching rates and guidelines. Check them out at lendesk.com slash Finmo. Get them to give you a test drive. It is the only way you can experience how slick it is. All right. Uh, join me in this conversation that I have with Tuan. Hey, Tuan. Welcome to the show. Great to be here. So, hey, I'm excited to chat with you about the top four myths of commercial financing that most people don't know. I, I chat with you before we turn on the recorder. I was like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And I've been doing this for 18 years. So this is going to be a lot of fun. But before we get into that, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into the mortgage biz. Yeah, I've been in this for over 18 years. I originally started off uh, in banking at various roles within commercial bank. So I did that for about 10 years. And then I became a broker about eight years ago. Uh, and then I joined uh, DLC Clear Trust, uh, where I was on a commercial desk there, and we supported over 300 agents uh, with commercial deals. Yeah. And then uh, last year we reconnected, and so definitely, uh, so it's exciting to join you and your team uh, to run that BC commercial team. Yeah, I know it's been awesome. And you, you, I know if you, you're listening to this, I'm looking at you going, dude, you look so young. I like 18 years in the mortgage business. So go to YouTube and if you want to see how young Tuan looks. So. Uh, <laughs> How, what made you get into commercial? So like versus because it is a it's a bit of a niche and I think it can be a good one. But what made you go down there? Yeah, actually, originally I started my career as a commercial insurance underwriter. Uh, so in university, I got an internship. Uh, so I did a lot of underwriting on the commercial side. But it's very similar to commercial banking. And then I when I graduated, it became a commercial real estate appraiser. Um, so I did that for about a year and a half. But I realized I enjoy the sales side a lot more. So I, I end up going into commercial banking right after that. So that's what got me into commercial banking. All right. So Tawan, so there's these the four big myths that people have when it comes to commercial financing. What What is the first myth? Yeah, I think the first one, a lot of people think that you can't uh, finance a residential property through commercial lending. So there's a whole area there where, say for example, I have a client who is trying to qualify under the residential lending arm, but they can't get approved because they have like, multiple properties or they already max out their borrowing power, we can actually move to the commercial lending side and get that deal done as well and just kind of isolate that asset. So there's a different way of underwriting where we can still get that deal approved. And the good thing is that it won't show up in your credit bureau. So that's the kind of first myth a lot of people didn't know. And I, I find and it's a very Do you have share. to be self-employed for that or how, how does that work? No, you could just you could be a salaried worker and you want to buy investment property. Say you're buying a pre-sale condo and you just can't qualify at the bank. We would then con we'll maybe open a holding company and then we would do that through a holding company. I see. So you don't have to be self-employed at all. Yeah. And do you have an example of one that you've done recently or that you can think of where it was someone that you'd a problem like this that you'd solve for someone? Yeah. Just yeah, because I'd like to make it really practical for people listening. No, for sure. I think a big market segment is I work with a lot of realtors. Uh, so a lot of realtors, they... They invest into real estate and properties themselves, um, and they have their own operating business, like the PREC. So a lot of times they have their own primary residence. They already max out their boring power, especially with nowadays with the stress tests and, and all that. It, it's a lot harder to qualify. And then the next step would be a B lender or a private lender. But in between that, we can also go through commercial lending. So there's advantage there where I helped a realtor. I think he had two pre-sales that were closing this year, and he could not qualify at the at tier one bank. 
So we put those two pre-sell into a holding company. So that would be his real estate investment trust or company. And then from there, we did the loan through commercial lending and we got them approved. Right. And what kind of down payment are you looking at on something like that? Yeah. So the down payments, but that's the, that's the kicker, I would say, is that you need to put a little more down payment sometimes, depending where you buy. So if it's in Vancouver, the purchase price tend to be high and the rental income cannot support the debt. So a lot of time I'll say you're looking at 60% loan, loan to value. Right. But if you right. buy in different markets, like say Calgary or Alberta, you can get a higher leverage. So it really depends where you're buying, the purchase price and the rental income. Right. So the, the, the it, okay, that'll affect the, and then are the rates and stuff similar to residential? Yeah, actually right now, say this year, the rates are very similar. They're either on par or about half percent higher. Um, and there's additional fees, like lenders usually charge a fee in the commercial side. So there's additional costs. But I think the but key- there would be in most B, like, so you're basically saying maybe instead of B, if the, depending on a, a commercial option might actually be, but could be better depending on the situation. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Like it might be, sometimes a B lender, like an equitable bank is pretty good. But there might be pros and cons to that offer. So I say commercial lending is just another tool for brokers to help solve a problem for the client. Uh, another reason why is that maybe that you don't want that to show up in your credit bureau. So right. by doing through commercial lending, these this this mortgage will not show up in the credit bureau. So that's another key factor as well. Okay. So myth number one is residential properties. What's myth number two? Yeah, myth number two. Um, a lot of people didn't know if, if you own an apartment uh, or a property with five or more units, there's some favorable lending programs out there where you could get up to 95% financing, 50-year amortization, and the rates are actually lower than residential uh, real estate. So it's like 4 to 5%. So it's been it's through CMHC and a few lenders that we know. And it's a, it's a huge market right now where I think a lot of investors right now are looking at buying multi-unit apartment buildings. And... and People didn't know that you can get some favorable financing where it's actually better than I say traditional residential financing. Right. And so what, so this is the, it's, it's obviously there's a default insurance premium on there. So what would that look yeah. like? So you got, you get pretty good rates, but then you got an insurance premium. Correct. And, but you could also yeah. tie up less cash conceivably, right? Yeah. So I think as an investor, you're going, I don't mind paying this in this premium, which is going to be amortized over 50 years. Right. Uh, so when, cause normally I think on the residential side, you can get 30 year amortization. Now you can get 40, 45, 50 years. That really helps with cash flow. Yeah. And then you can also refinance down the road when rates decrease and stuff like that. But this allows investor to continue building their real estate portfolio. So do you see a niche of investors looking specifically for properties that are five plus just so that they can access that program because of the cheaper funds and lower down payments? 100%. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of definitely webinars and, and seminars that are promoting this where some clients might not even have the down payment, but they secure the property and then they raise capital through investors as well. So I've seen all that side of the world, but it's definitely a very uh, attractive asset class. I, I find right the last year or two. For sure. And, and when they, okay, I'm going to ask some technical questions and sure. assume I know nothing. Like I'm not, you know, I'm going to like say, tell me like I'm 10, as I always say. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the loan to value, is it determined by rent? Like, is it a debt coverage thing or how do they determine loan to value? Like how much, how, how high you could go? No, you're right on track. Yes. Depending on the rental income. So I yes, find. Yes. So you're saying I could do commercial. I can't. I'm kidding. But no, so you're I, really I haven't. I can ask the questions enough to get in yeah. the path, but I, I would not trust myself to do it because there's it, yeah. there's a hundred ways you can screw it up. So it definitely depends on the rental income. Uh, there are times we could even if a client owns their own business and other they have other cash flow, we can also add that company as a guarantor to help increase the cash flow as well. So there are different ways to do it, but I'll say just from a simplicity standpoint. They would look at the, the, the building and the rental income. So in certain province where the price is still really good, the cap rates are high, the rental income's high, you can get a higher leverage. Right. So like in, are you talking like Alberta or are you thinking like man, like yeah, Alberta, you thinking? even northern BC, smaller towns where the, the price point is not too high and the, the rental income is there, so they call it the cap rate is high. So in Vancouver, I think you're not gonna get the ninety five percent finance. No, I can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So myth yeah. one is residential, but myth two is you can do prop uh, five unit and up at 95% loan to value. Yeah. What's myth number three? Yep. Um, the myth number three is a lot of clients think that with commercial lending or when they hear the word commercial, you have to put a minimum 25% down. Um, and that's not true. So there's a lot of case where we can actually put as little as 0% down or even 25% down on commercial real estate purchase. Um that applies only if you are, say, buying a property for your own business, like you're operating out of, say, you're buying a commercial property and you're going to be operating a business out of it. That's when it, uh, you can put less than 25% down. 
Okay. So if I, I own something, so you can give me an example of one that you've done. So again, I like to give people yeah. something they can think about. Yeah. So we actually worked with one of the agents in our firm. Uh, she had a referral a client owns a restaurant or if they're renting a restaurant uh, out in Vernon and they had the opportunity to purchase this, uh, this property. And so when we looked at their financials, we, she thought she had to put at least 30% down. That was her hope. And she thought she couldn't buy it. So the good thing is we ran through her financials and we were able to get her 110% financing. So we got her extra money in addition to the wow. capital to, to purchase the restaurant. Or the so property. does that money have to go in? Is that like a purchase plus or was it just based on uh, the business, the strength of the business and then the, the real estate combined? How do, how do they come up with that? Yeah, so, it's based on, yeah so they looked at the real estate. Um, so we covered 100% of the purchase and they gave the extra 10% as working capital. So the business is very strong and doing very well and it was growing. So she got another 10% line of credit. So that'd be great for like an emergency fund or even to buy supplies, like food supplies and stuff like that. Right. And then, so on something like, what's the pricing like on something like that? Again, I, I don't want to like, the thing about this is you could be listening to this like six months or a year, but just give me a range even of like what pricing is like on. Yeah. When you do Today, like when we got that deal done, it was a few months ago. So the rates are still the same. They're around six to 7% depending on the term. So you yeah. take a five-year term, the rates will be lower. You take a one-year term, the rates will be higher. Right. Yeah. The good okay. news is the interest rates have gone down quite a bit the last two months as well. So that's going to be changing as well. So if a mortgage broker is listening to this, a great email campaign to send to your database is, hey, if you if you own, if you're a business owner and own your own business, I may be able to get you financing up to 110%. And even if it just starts a conversation, what? 100, like if you own, if you want to buy your building or own your building, and then now you've got an opportunity for a commercial referral, right? It's kind of the McDonald's theory. You know, they're buying, like, they're offering their business, but they also own the real estate. And that's where the money is, right? Building the equity. That's that's really their retirement plan, ultimately, because a lot of times the small businesses, that it's it, they, sure they spit off cash, but they don't, there's not, you know, they usually, the money's going back to the business. So it is, if you can, if you're a business owner, you can own your own building and be paying that off over time. I've got a friend in Victoria, they own three coffee shops and they work, they're good coffee shops, run them for years but they own all their locations. And that is the, like the coffee shops that go away tomorrow, they're still set because they, they've owned these buildings, these, unit, and, these and spaces for years. It gives the business stability too, right? I mean, your landlord can also sell the property one day. Like actually another agent within our team just messaged us today about a coffee shop in Soyuz. So the own, she's been renting there for years and now they're looking, the owner wants to sell it and she wants to buy it because if the new buyer buys it, they might not want to keep her, her, her there. So, it gives your business stability too. So it's not just about the real estate purchase, but we can do an equity takeout on the business as well. Right. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story about Walmart. So yeah. Sam Walden, his very first store, he was, was a, called Benjamin Franklin's and it was a variety store and he had a lease. It's basically think of like a franchise he was running. He didn't own it. And he had to share a percentage of his profits with the owner of the building. And he didn't realize because he was brand new that his lease did not have a guaranteed renewal clause and so when he saw him bring it, and this, they were selling everything that was a nickel and a dime. It was a nickel and dime store, $250,000 a year in sales. The owner said, I'm not renewing the lease. I'm going to take over this business. And I'm going to run it here myself. And after that, he would only buy property. Walmart was like, they would go buy the land because they did not want to get burned like that again. Because customers go back to the same location. The thing it's is, location, is, like, is a, yeah. like, especially that type of business. And so this, what you're talking about makes a lot of sense. So if you mortgage brokers listening, if you've got clients that are, our business owners that are in a location, what a fantastic campaign. And and also in 10 years, they're going to be thanking, like, thank you for putting this together. Huge. For me. Yeah. yeah. Like they're going to thank you because now they get to own it and they, they control now they're, they can control that business a yeah. lot better. Because yeah, totally. And uh, uh, I was going to tie into that part. It's just like great. A lot of our, our, our brokers are working, say with that real bank, B lender, and they're, they're dealing with self-employed clients. That's a great segment right there to go. Hey, you own your own business. Have you thought about maybe, purchasing your own property or can we evaluate your business to see if we can take more equity out of that business. So right. I would kind of share agents that story that you're doing the residential side, but you can also even talk about your business as well and add an extra service to your, to your, you know, your business. Right. And if I'm a business owner, again, I, there's more stability in owning my space than renting because rent can change. Owners can change all kinds of other stuff. And so, uh, and for a lot of them, that will be their only retirement plan because yeah. often you can't, those small businesses can't sell for a very big multiple if it's like no. a little restaurant or something. There's not, they'll make some money. They'll get their equipment yeah. back and stuff, but like there's not a ton of money in it. So yeah. owning the real estate is, is the, is the tip. That is the key. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's so the big part. Yeah. Yeah. Myth number one was resident. I'm just doing a recap quick. Yeah. Myth, residential properties, you can do commercial apartments, five plus units. There's some, some amazing financing options. 
Uh, you can do 0% down on commercial property if you're, if you're using it for your business. So if it's an operating business out of that location. Uh, so what's myth number four? It kind of ties in the last one, but a lot of people think commercial lending is only about commercial real estate. But there's a whole world of commercial financing that we can help clients with. And I'm going to kind of list a few really quick. Say uh, mergers and acquisition loan. You're a dentist. You want to expand or you want to buy out a book of business from another dentist. Say a, someone retiring. We can actually provide financing on that. So it's non-real estate related because I think the myth is a lot of you think you need to, it has to be commercial real estate. Um, if you have a life insurance policy, a lot of uh, high net worth clients have this policy where there's cash value in it. We can actually leverage against that, like taking equity out of that life insurance. Uh, another item is um, a lot of business have account receivable where someone owes you money. We can actually leverage against that purchase order to give you the money today and while you wait for your suppliers to pay you back. Um, a lot of, uh, or another, when you're trying to open a coffee shop and you need the renovation money, we can also provide financing for that as well. And the last, even part if it's, is, even if it's leased, so even if you don't yeah. own the location, you can still get financing on a, yeah. So we helped like a, a, a poke shop recently. It's a franchise. They are just leasing the space, but it, the renovation is about half a million. And that's a lot My of money. Goodness. Yeah. Just hey, listen, guy. Okay. I want to say one thing. If you're a mortgage broker, the, the cost to get into this business is so freaking low when you yeah. think about it. A poke shop is $500,000 and you, yeah. yeah. It's going to take a while to pay that off, right? So like, yeah, we're lucky. Like our, our cost of and like uh, business is very low to be a mortgage broker for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, yeah, that was one you said financing. And then what is there any other ones? Uh, even equipment financing. Say someone might have, say you, you have a client that owns a business, they have a brewery and they already bought the machines by financing it. Well, we can even convert that finance into a lease. There's some advantage, kind of like car loan versus car lease. Uh, or you might have bought that asset outright and you didn't know you can refinance it. So a lot of the equipment that could be very expensive, we could look at financing it to kind of increase your cash flow and get some capital back. Yeah. Right. So, do you guys also do loans against like the, you know, the pay, what do they call that? When, I know there's accounts receivables, but like when yeah. people can tell how much money they're, what is that factoring or is it called factoring? Uh, yeah, factoring. So inventory. Yes. Tell me about, tell me about factoring. I knew about it, but I, obviously I don't Huge. remember. Some business are very asset heavy where they have a lot of inventory sitting there and, and these inventory are not, you know, depending on the type of inventory, but say you have a certain amount of inventory, we can lend up to say 50 to 75% depending on the industry. So we do have to look at the quality of the so inventory. Can you give me an example of that so, so somebody understands what fa like of a, a, a business and just a, you know. Yeah. Um, let's just say a building supply material company. They're supplying kitchen cabinets. So that's a big one where they have a lot. They have to buy the inventory ahead of time. Yeah. And then they then sell to the client. So there's a bit of a, a process to go from uh, shipping it from overseas to here and then selling it to the end user. So a lot of time that inventory is just sitting there and, and it, it creates a bit of a cash crunch for a lot of our clients. So if they have that inventory, we can lend against that and provide a loan so that um, they can get some capital to support the business or go out and get more inventory. So that's always been a problem for a lot of customers that they, they run out of capital to buy more. So they have to make sure they sell their inventory before they buy the next order. But that can slow down their sales cycle too. Yeah, I saw a developer that in Kelowna went bust during the 2008 cycle and he would take yeah. the deposit from one house and use it to keep working on the next one but he started running out of cash and then once he yeah. stopped getting deposits everything stalled and yeah. it, or, or he used the deposits to make the payments on his other loans and then yeah. he blew up but uh, yeah. yeah uh yeah. anyway it sucks yeah no that's a tough one for sure yeah uh, i've always often joked that if i wanted to sell things i would want to sell to developers because they're the most optimistic people they're like oh it's gonna be great like some of them anyways like they're like they're straight up oh, yeah. gamblers man for sure. I think yeah, a lot of, and especially a lot of business owners too, there's different types. Some are just yeah. super optimistic. I think art, and that's where I find a lot of, uh, when they go to the bank, they're too optimistic. And that's where I think our roles brokers are very important. As we come in, we try to synthesize what they're saying to a terminology or at least to a more reasonable story so the bank. Reset, yeah, reset options. their expectations and then yes. provide yeah. options. Because yeah. if you go to the bank, you go, hey, I, my business is going to 10x next year, super ambitious. They're like, sure, buddy. <laughs> So I think that's why our role is so important. We work with developers because I work with a lot and also business owners. Um, everyone is going to say, hey, my business is going to 10x or do really well. Um, so we always try to make sure that we're reasonable with our lenders as well. Yeah. The way you can test this is if you go into a room, let's say you're doing a, a talk and you say, How, who here, raise a hand, who's better than average driver? Like everybody puts their hand up. But that's not, it's not mathematically possible that everybody in the room is actually a, bet, you yeah. know, a, 
a, a top yeah, driver. Better than, average, right? <laughs> better than average. It's just not like yeah. that's not how this works. Uh, so the thing I'm picking up from this though is that there's literally like you, there's 12 different ways you can find money for somebody. Real estate is one of them, but there's a lot of different angles. And so yeah. I think like if you're listening to this, A, this is a great thing to eventually learn, but B, get somebody to help you because if, if I tried to do this myself, even though I understood, there's a part of it I understood a little bit, but I didn't know there was like seven other ways that I could actually potentially help solve this person's problem and get the money, which makes a big difference. And if I'm competing against you, I'm going to, I'm going to get slaughtered. Like if, I, if it's you and me going head to head on a commercial deal, I'm done. Like I'm, I'm, you know, no, no matter, no amount of salesmanship is going to convince the person to work with me when I don't have as many tools in my tool chest. So how, if people are interested to like chat with you, because you can work with people talking about how they can find you and then what you typically will do when somebody says, Hey, I'm uh, you know, I'll help you out kind of thing. Yeah. So they can find me on my, our website at bluestonecapital.ca or on social media like Instagram and, uh, and even on, uh, just online as well. I work through our Bricks um, website. Uh, in terms of working with agents, yeah, we I, I, I definitely been working with a lot of agents uh, the last since I started. That's kind of my big part of my business is working with other agents, helping them grow their business. Because uh, I know a lot are focusing on residential, and that's my niche. It's commercial. We can it's it's collaboration over competition. Is what I believe yeah, which in. I, I love that. Yep. Yeah, like I always feel like you know we're in the same industry, but we're focusing on different things, and and that's where I think. The fun is right we work with other agents um so they can come they definitely reach out to me and any questions i can help them and a lot of time i tell them that you know we're, we got to trust each other and and you know for me it's about getting that deal done and once we talk to the client i can help kind of figure out okay is there a deal here or not because if the agent try to do it themselves i find a lot of time uh, they might end up losing a deal to a competing broker on the other side of the world so you if they know what they're if the person knows commercial so give me an example yeah. of somebody that like that it has worked with you because we were chatting about this and I was like, huh, that's interesting. Cause they thought there was like one referral there and you, you found a bunch of them for yes. them. Yeah. So uh, we worked with an agent uh, within our, um, like, it was two years ago, he referred us a developer and it was just for a smaller project. And we, we successfully closed that deal. But within that process, I think just asking the right questions, building the trust with the client, we uncovered way more business like the, the developer is opening up a hotel he was doing multiple types of business so not just developing so within that year i think we end up uh, that agent for that one referral ended up making almost like three hundred thousand dollars on on that one referral uh the good thing is they really trusted us in that process so he just referred us to the client the client and he learned along the way too so he was in all the emails the phone calls but we were able to uncover i think a lot of business from from that one referral from that one entry point. So, and that, that's awesome. Yeah. I think that's, uh, so if you're, yeah, totally. So, um, yeah, they basically two things find you online too. If you click on this show, you can just be a link to be able to message you and say, Hey, I, I want to chat. I've got something to run past you guys because I love what you guys are doing. And I love that you take care of the clients and brokers that you work with. So I think it's fantastic, man. Anything last, anything I should have asked you about commercial financing that I didn't. I mean, again, this, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm still yeah. a white belt or maybe a blue belt in this stuff. No, I think this is very exciting. I think everyone should know about it or at least know how to talk about it and bring it up to your clients because I think it's such a missed opportunity. I know there's a lot of business on the residential side, but if you start talking or at least making sure in your conversations to kind of think about commercial lending a little bit and bring it up to clients, you would be amazed at how much kind of how much deals you can uncover uh, just by changing that mindset a little bit uh, in terms of your sales conversation. Right. And just send an email to your database and say, Hey, just to let you know, if you're anybody who's self-employed, if you, if you have a building that your space that you want to own or own, we can do up to 110% financing. And so that alone will get people going, what? And then you start, and even if you, they don't all qualify, you could start conversations. They or they might know someone too. Or they know someone, Oh, my friend needs a place or whatever. So I, I think that's a, that's a low hanging fruit thing. So that's awesome, brother. For right. sure. Thanks for chatting with me, Tuan. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, thanks again for listening. And hopefully you got some ideas or inspired on your, you know, just different solutions you have for your clients. So as I said, in this episode, I would strongly encourage you to send an email out to your database and just put, put that in the subject line. Hey, business owners, a uh, question, quick question, business owners. And then, Hey, it's Scott. Just, uh, just curious if you know anybody who's self-employed and looking to finance where the business they work in. We may be able to finance up to 110% of the value of that building. Reach out to me. I'd be happy to see if I can help. Have a great day. I guarantee you that that will start conversations if you have any size of database and probably make some money between now, hopefully between now and Christmas to uh, pay for your Christmas.
your Christmas fees and bills. All right. Anyways, thanks for listening. And um, as I always say, there's no problem in your mortgage business that someone else hasn't already solved. Your problem or challenge rather is that who's got the answer, the solution to my problem. Hopefully this podcast helps with some of those for you. Thanks again. And I will see you on the next episode.